guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kelsey. I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History and a graduate of Cambridge University. So I actually studied classics at undergraduate level and then Egyptology at master's level. So this is the second video in a series where I look at historically inspired films and talk about their inspiration and the stuff that they kind of just got out of nowhere. If you're interested, don't forget to go check out my last video where I reviewed the 1999 Mummy movie, which is one of my absolute favourites. And today we're going to be talking about the movie Troy. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, don't forget to go check out all of my socials and give me a follow. And if you enjoy this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. So without further ado, let's get into the film Troy. <laughs> Unlike The Mummy, um, I'm not gonna lie, Troy is not one of my favorite historically inspired films, but I'm not here to just slander it for the next 20 minutes or half an hour of your life. So that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm gonna try and find and understand their inspiration. And they do get some bits quite true to the narrative. Others, they seem to change for no reason, which is why it's not one of my favorites. I am also gonna try and keep this video a little bit shorter than the last one because with Troy, it's all based on ancient historical myths. So I could be here for the next like six, seven hours telling you every single fact and detail if it's true or if it's not true. And I really don't wanna do that because I don't think you would enjoy it either. So I'm just gonna pick out some key points within the plot line. And then if there's anything that I've missed that you really wanna know about, just comment it down below and I'll do a part two. For those of you who don't know about the film Troy or don't know it in that much detail, it's basically based on this historical myth or legend of the Trojan War. And our main source for this is Homer's Iliad. And if you don't know, the Trojan War is ultimately fought between the Greeks and the Trojans. The side of the Greeks includes characters like Achilles, Agamemnon, Menelaus, whereas the Trojans includes Hector, Paris, and Priam, just to name a few so that you can kind of orientate yourself. We then know small details about what happened before and after the war from pieces like Virgil's Aeneid and plays like the Trojan women. For this video, I'm really gonna focus on the Iliad because that's kind of the main narrative that the film Troy is inspired by and they generally follow this plot line with little details being changed. So the Iliad is actually a poem that originates from around the 8th century BCE. And this would have been performed orally. This would have been a spoken performance, but now we obviously just read it in a book form. And when we get it in this form, we say that it's split up into books, kind of like our modern day chapters. And throughout the years, we've generally said that it was written by, well, composed by Homer. <coughs> However, um, since then, we've started to realise that maybe there were a lot of composers going around and that it can't be attributed to this singular individual, of which we know very little about. The plot of the Iliad generally explores the themes of glory, fate, war and family, just to name a few. I'm now going to try my very best to give a very bite-sized description and summary of the plot of the Iliad so that we know a little bit more about what's happening in the film Troy. I'm however going to omit some details because it's a very long narrative and a lot of the characters in the Iliad don't actually appear in the film Troy, so I'm just going to leave them out for this purpose. Whew. Wish me luck. So, the actual narrative of the Iliad starts over nine years into the Trojan War, and it kind of starts with the abduction of two females, Chryseis and Briseis. Briseis being the only one that actually appears in the film Troy. Unfortunately, Chryseis is the daughter of the priest of Apollo, so her father goes to the character Agamemnon, who's taken Chryseis, and pleads for her to be returned. However, Agamemnon is taken up in his own pride and folly and says absolutely not when all his men are begging him to return this girl. Unsurprisingly, as the priest of Apollo, Apollo starts to get involved and sends a plague after the Greek men. Agamemnon is one of the kings of ancient Greece, along with his brother. And Achilles is really just a soldier. He's still a nobleman, but he's of a lower ranking than Agamemnon. So when things start to go wrong with this plague and Achilles confronts Agamemnon to return the girl, 
he feels a little bit undermined and threatened, so he lashes back. After a long and pretty brutal argument between the men, Agamemnon decides that he will return Chryseis, but Achilles will have to return the girl Briseis, who he'd received almost as a prize in his war. Outraged by the fact that he now feels like he's been undermined, Achilles says that he's going to leave the war and he will no longer fight for the Greeks. And this is a big deal because Achilles is one of their best fighters, but again Agamemnon is blinded by his own pride so refuses to really admit this to himself. Ultimately, when Achilles leaves the war, things start to go even more downhill for the Greeks. There are a few ups and downs with characters like Diomedes and Odysseus, but the film doesn't go into as much detail with them, so we're just going to put that aside for today. And then if you want a separate Iliad video, that's great, and you can just let me know. Realising his folly, Agamemnon eventually gives in and sends a group of three people to try and convince Achilles to return. And with this, he offers up many prizes, even saying that he is happy to give the girl Briseis back to Achilles. However, Achilles is still not having it. His own pride is also wounded, so he doesn't want to go back into the war. Unlike Achilles, his very close companion named Patroclus starts to feel bad for the men, and he eventually convinces him to let himself dress up in Achilles' armour so that they think that he is Achilles, and it kind of rekindles their hopes and spirits for the war, and they might start to do better. And Achilles agrees to this, letting him go to the war, but giving him the rules that he basically can't go too far, and that he doesn't want him to get hurt, because this is his very close companion, which I will go into more detail about, because I'm sure some of you are very excited to hear the mention of Patroclus' name. Unfortunately, Patroclus starts to get carried away when things go well for him in the war, as he successfully kills people like Sar Arpedon. And in this he keeps going and going until eventually he is confronted by Hector. And he is then killed by Hector. <laughs> Devastated by the loss of his companion, Achilles rejoins the war, basically to try and get revenge for his friend. In doing so, the Greeks start to win again and Achilles eventually kills Hector outside the walls of Troy. But he didn't just kill Hector. He went a little bit crazy, probably driven by the emotions of losing his companion, but he goes too far because he actually gets the dead body of Hector and starts to drag him around the city and refuses to return him for any kind of burial. Which in ancient Greece is a very important asset to their religion because they don't believe that the dead can truly rest until they receive this proper funeral rite. So the Iliad then eventually ends with King Priam, the father of Hector, going to Achilles, sneaking into the camp at night and risking his own life to beg Achilles to return the body of Hector and that they have just 12 days of truce so that they can have the proper funeral. And that is it. That's where Homer's Iliad ends. However, obviously the film has a little bit of extra detail that we get from our other sources like the Aeneid. From that description, some of you may be thinking, okay, the film's not too bad. It generally, it follows that kind of narrative, which it does, amazing, and it has those characters. Fantastic. However, why they choose to change some aspects is infuriating and pointless. I think the best example of just how this film goes wrong is the fact that when we meet the characters of Achilles and Patroclus, we see them training together. And they're training in ancient Greek ruins. How are they ruins? This is like the end of the Dark Ages of ancient Greece. When were they ruined? First of all, the film actually starts with Agamemnon already going to these places just to gain power, and Helen has not actually been kidnapped yet by Paris, unlike the Iliad where we start already nine years into this battle. And because of this change, the entire Trojan War actually gets condensed into a couple of weeks. So I... I get why they did it, because obviously a film I don't think can really reflect nine years of struggle, but it means that you don't get the same level of exasperation within the soldiers who have been away from their friends and family for over nine years now. 
So we meet the characters of Agamemnon and Achilles, and then we have this banquet scene between the Greeks and the Trojans, and it's at this point that Paris seduces Helen and convinces her to run away together with him on the ship back to Troy. I get why the film has chosen to interpret it and portray it this way, because there are actual later Greek sources which convey it that Helen was properly seduced by Paris and that she fell in love with him and chose to run away to Troy. But to explain this a little bit better and something that the film omits, I'm actually going to talk about the myth behind this abduction. So I'm going to give you my own little ekphrasis here and talk about the wedding of Thetis and Peleus, which is actually the parents of Achilles. During this wedding, an argument kind of erupts between three goddesses, which are Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena. And in this argument, they're debating who the most beautiful is amongst them. The gods refuse to judge this, so they get the mortal Paris. Paris struggles to choose between them all, so they all kind of barter with him and say what they can offer him if he chooses them. First of all, Hera offers all of Europe and Asia to be his. Athena then offers skill in battle. Finally, Aphrodite offers him the most beautiful woman on earth, which is Helen. However, Aphrodite kind of omits the fact that Helen is already married to Menelaus. This is not a rare event for Helen. As the most beautiful woman on earth, all of the men of ancient Greece and Europe were after her. So the wise Odysseus creates the idea that they should make a pact. As soon as Menelaus wins Helen's hand in marriage, all the other suitors who wanted her have to swear that they will protect this union. So when she is inevitably abducted by Paris or Aphrodite, the myths actually vary with the exact process of the abduction. But when this happens, all the men of Greece are sworn to protect it, so they have to go to war to return her. So, personally, they're justified by saying that she is in love with Paris or Orlando Bloom, but as a human being, it makes you question just how quickly a woman could do that and knowing the consequences. She knew that if it happened, it would mean war and the deaths of hundreds and thousands of people. And I personally don't think she would do it, but they're justified in choosing that plot line. It just completely changes the way you interpret it. And I think really starts, it doesn't give her a full female character, which irritates me a little bit. Towards the beginning of the film also, we have Achilles talking to his mother, Thetis. And as I just briefly mentioned, this is correct. His mother was Thetis and she is kind of divine in essence as a sea nymph where his father, Peleus, that we don't meet, is just a mortal man. And we do know from the Iliad in Book 9 that he does receive a kind of prophecy, which is exactly the one they deliver in the film. In essence, the prophecy states that if he goes and joins the Trojan War, he will become famous, his name will live on the tongues of men forever and ever, but he will die. If he chooses to stay away from the war, he will live a happy and content life until he's 99, until he's so old. But ultimately, when he dies, when his children dies and his grandchildren dies, he will be forgotten. Obviously, this is an important moment in both the book of the Iliad and the film, because this is highlighting these themes of what is glory worth? What's more important? What does it actually mean to be a hero? In the film, we then do have this accurate idea of Achilles withdrawing from the war because Agamemnon takes his prize of Briseis away from him. So this is great. Again, we're getting this same kind of dynamics between Achilles and Agamemnon, and we're getting this prideful and foolish character in Agamemnon and the Achilles feeling like he's been offended and lost his pride. However, to kind of Hollywoodize this plot line, we have this idea that Achilles and Briseis fall in love. That despite being kidnapped in their first acquaintance, and the fact that in the Iliad he kills her brother and her parents, they decide to push the narrative that they were in love. And that's why he's so offended, when really, if you read it in the Iliad, 
it's more just the fact that she is this prize and represents the way he's viewed by others and just his pride. Well, you can kind of justify this because Homer in the Iliad does sometimes hint at the fact that he was going to go back and ultimately marry Briseis. It's not the true meaning that you get from the book. And this annoys me twofold because, again, I think it dehumanizes and trivializes the fact that she was a slave who was kidnapped and beaten and treated as an object. And it's just almost this Stockholm syndrome without acknowledging that that's what it is. Maybe she did fall in love with him, but that's because she was abused. There was no kind of fantastical romance between them. And I think that's just, that really like, I think that's upsetting that they chose to do it in that way. The second reason that this annoys me is because they choose to focus on this as the central relationship and his drive rather than him and Patroclus, where if you've read the Iliad or you know anything about Achilles and Patroclus, their bond means a lot more than Achilles and some slave girl. But I'm gonna put a pin in it for now because we don't fully appreciate their relationship in the film into a little bit later, even though we do in the Iliad. So I'm gonna to get to that point a bit later and I'm gonna give you a very long rant. The next major kind of plot point is that to end this war and dispute, Paris finally volunteers that he is going to fight Menelaus one-on-one -on -one and whoever wins will get to take Helen. And this does happen in the Iliad. This is factual, I can give you that. The film is also very good at capturing the coward that Paris is because he literally does try and run and hide and it's kind of his brother that needs to step up but not in the exact way that they do it in the film. The key difference being that Menelaus doesn't die and I don't know why they killed him. In the film when Paris ultimately runs away Hector has to step up and fight instead, basically. He retaliates against the threatening Menelaus, and in doing so, he stabs and kills him. And... Menelaus doesn't even die in the Iliad. He successfully gets Helen back, and they go back to Greece, and they live out their lives. Why did they kill him? And as a side point, they also kill Agamemnon. They have Briseis kill him at the end of the film. And again, Agamemnon doesn't die. If you know anything about Greek theater or mythology, we know that he goes back home and he's killed by Clytemnestra, which is stealing an epic moment there. I don't know why they've chosen to kill these two characters. Like, if anybody has an, any idea of how this might serve the plot and justify such a massive change, let me know because I'm clueless. In the Iliad, however, the fight takes place and as soon as Paris starts to lose and become vulnerable against Menelaus, the goddess Aphrodite saves him and takes him back to the castle. People choose to interpret the deities in the Iliad in different ways. Some may view it as actual gods and goddesses intervening, some kind of view it as an allegory of the individual's emotions. So obviously, Aphrodite becomes kind of the patron deity to Paris after his choice by choosing Helen and in this instant it kind of represents the fact that he's always going to choose his love for Helen over everything else and this element of being a coward. So you can argue that when he runs away that's exactly what they're showing, they're choosing that interpretation, which again I appreciate. Now I feel like we can delve a little bit more into the character of Patroclus and his relationship with Achilles. So in the film they state that he is the younger cousin to Achilles and this kind of justifies their close bond in their relationship. However, in the Iliad this isn't true. They are old childhood friends as Patroclus is sent to live with Achilles at a young age but they're not the first cousins kind of relationship that they put in the film. What's really upsetting is this kind of washes out the fact that their relationship, while it's never expressed explicitly in the Iliad to be a same-sex relationship, the way that he describes him as being his number one companion and their close feelings and the fact that he motivates him ultimately to avenge him and rejoin the war, it hints at a much deeper relationship than just cousins. 
And this again is reflected in later Greek sources who explicitly state that they were a same sex couple. For me, it's just upsetting that in the film they chose to just completely wash this out and focus on the heterosexual couple of Achilles and Prisaeus, whereas they would have more justification and reason to say that Achilles and Patroclus are together. And this often gives deeper meaning to the rest of the narrative when Patroclus is killed and he has to avenge him. The feelings that are expressed towards Patroclus are just so much stronger because even with Briseis, when Agamemnon ultimately offers her back, Achilles doesn't care. He even says in later books he wishes she had died because it would have saved him all the trouble. He doesn't care about the actual woman, it's what she stands for. Whereas Patroclus, he cares so deeply that he's, knowing, he's knowingly giving up his life for him because he knows as soon as he enters that battle, he is going to die. He will get famous, but he will die for that friend. And he wouldn't have done it for Briseis. Anyway, it's annoying. They could have done a lot more in the film with that, and I think it would have made a much better narrative and reflected the true essence of the Iliad and their relationship. But they copped out, and it's upsetting. On to Patroclus's death. So he is killed at the hands of Hector, and this is when he's disguised in the armour of Achilles. So in the film, they make it clear that Hector didn't realise that it was not Achilles until he'd already killed him. In the book, all the men believe it's Achilles, and this is what motivates them. However, Hector does know, because the god Apollo is the person who finally tells him to go after Patroclus and kill him, which changes it a little bit. Next, they accurately portray the fact that Achilles is motivated by the death of his friend and that he wants revenge and to go directly after Hector. This is correct. This happens. He then does ultimately stand and fight Hector and kills him. And that gruesome bit where you see him being tied behind the chariot and dragged back, that happens. He drags him round the city walls and it's pretty grim and he doesn't give him a proper burial. He takes him back to the camp and kind of leaves him there to rot or continues to drag him behind his chariot. So that accurate. In the Iliad you also see the very raw and real emotions of Hector because he is scared. He knows what's gonna happen once he sees Achilles approaching and he runs away. He runs around the city three times until eventually one of the goddesses disguised as his friend tells him to stop and to confront him and that she's gonna support him. But then the gods abandon him. They leave it up to the mortals. But in the face of this is when you see his true bravery because he knows he's been abandoned and that he will probably die, but he faces them. Hector is one of the things in the film that I love the way they've managed to do it. They really delve into the character and it could be biased because I know it's weird to fall in love with a fictional character that you just read about, but I love Hector because you get so much depth. And it may be the benefit of the fact that it obviously takes place in Troy, so you get to see his relationship with his family, but it's just it's beautiful and then it does mean that finally when he's killed you feel emotions you didn't think you could feel with a narrative that's written thousands of years ago and the film is really good at setting him up as this in-depth character who is so he's so loyal the main thing is that he's loyal with this strong moral code and it really reigns true in the movie and it does mean that when he dies and you see this happening you feel bad you feel sad which ultimately helps them with this key theme of what is a hero, what is glory, because you're like, well, we're told that Achilles is the main character in this and that he's got this amazing fate, but at what cost? Hector didn't do anything bad. He was stuck in a situation where he had to protect his brother and his family and his country, and this is the price he gets? Like, is it worth it? Finally, towards the end of the film, we see Hector's father, Priam, going to Achilles. He sneaks into the camp at night and begs him for Hector's body back so that he can have this proper funerary rite. 
And again, this is actually true. This is what happens in the Iliad. And the film, I have to give it respect here because it takes a lot of the original Greek and translates it really well. It reigns true to what's actually being said in the Iliad. And that is fantastic. It creates a really poignant and emotional moment where you see this poor, frail father begging somebody like Achilles just to have his son back. And again, it continues to force you to question, was it worth it? Is that glory? At what cost? The Trojan horse happened, and this is an idea created by Odysseus. They bring it into the walls of Troy and they start to invade and kill everyone. And a lot of this death and despair does actually happen within Greek mythology. Specifically, unfortunately, the coward that is Paris does kill Achilles. He is ultimately, with his bow and arrow, shoots him in that one vulnerable spot where if you know the myth of Achilles is the one bit that Thetis missed when she was dipping him into the river Styx. So this is his vulnerability, his mortality. And Paris kills him. Unfortunately, in the Iliad as well, Hector's son dies. Along with many other Trojan children, he is thrown from the walls of Troy and a lot of the women were then taken away into slavery. But that is basically it. So if there's anything I missed, comment it down below and I'm happy to do a part two because I cannot talk about all of it in one video. We would be here for days. So don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next week. Bye.